As you know, on Sunday night or Monday morning of every week, we post a new expository semiotics explaining why we would choose which lectionary readings. But in these readings, our dream is and our, our desire is to help you read the signs and fondle the details and spot the seminal metaphors, the condensed signs and the stories that are a key for preaching to a digital culture. So strap on your seatbelt and join us as we prospect our passages for today. One sweet ear for Lent Talk number 80. This is a milestone, number 80, for the 26th of September, 2021. I want to begin with a little commentary on my shirt. And let me tell you why I'm wearing this and why it's significant to me theologically and hopefully to you. This past week, I, I met with some THD students at Evangelical Seminary, and one of the books that I had them read was a book that was initially published, believe it or not, in 1960. And it was published by a biblical scholar, a New Testament theologian at Yale, taught at Yale basically all of his life, named Paul S. Minier. He was born in, listen to this, 1906. He died in 2007. His last article he wrote that was published, he wrote at 100. This is a guy, one of my heroes, my scholarly academic heroes, that what he called uh, presented the church with dispatches from the front. Okay, And so what he did is he was out there as a biblical scholar taking biblical scholarship where he thought it should be headed, but it was so far ahead of his time. In 1960, he wrote this book, book called Images of the Church in the New Testament. He came up with over 100 images of the church, devoted a little chapter to each. So it's like a 100-plus um, chapter book, but it's like the chapters now, you know, two or three pages. That's all you get for a chapter. And, and that's what he was doing back then. But these were all images of the church and the biblical community, other biblical scholars kind of mocked it, laughed at it. How can you be slumming it, just exegeting images? You know, the most important thing is to exegete the words and to take on the verses. And, and But he was doing scholarship. Remember, he called it Dispatches from the Front. And it, I, when I uh, discovered this book, I didn't discover this book until after I was teaching myself, but it became one of the most important books of my life. And it quickly went out of print because nobody was buying it and the other academics were poo-pooing it. And um, so I started buying copies and I started buying, giving them as presents to everybody and, and making my students read this book. And, and uh, so they go on to book, uh, you know, book finder and, and the most important one, I think, abobooks.com. And I gave him his birthday presents, Christmas presents, whatever. When you got a present for me, um, a while, there was a while, this period of time, you got Paul S. Minier, Images of the Church in the New Testament. I was buying so many presents, uh, so many <laughs> books for presents, that uh, it, I started competing against myself because the price of them went from like $3 a book to $6 a book and then $10 a book. These are all, you know, secondhand books. And, and uh, so they became scarcer and scarcer. Uh, so there came a time then when each book was so rare uh, that I couldn't afford them anymore. So I kind of worked myself out of a, a, a gift. But Westminster John Knox finally, just before he died, 2004, realized the importance of this book, how far ahead of his time he was. This is a culture that doesn't think and speak in words, it speaks and thinks in images. This is one of the most important books that you can have on your shelf if you're a communicator of the gospel. And so they reissued it and it came back out just before he died in 2007, it came out in 2004. So he saw how many books published in you know, 50 years ago almost um, came back and came back strong. The, the, the other thing I, I love about Paulus Minier is, Minier is he wrote, 
he he wrote on a long leash as he read on a long leash. I mean, he was reading literature and and biblical scholarship and theology and and philosophy and all sorts of things, science, and he brought them all together in his writing. Uh, so you just didn't get biblical scholarship when you got Paulus Minier. And one of my favorite books, hence the shirt, is a book that he wrote um, called um, and. It is, I think, um, one of the, the, the greatest, he, he, had, he developed a special uh, interest in, in theology and music. And so he wrote some really good articles published in Theology Today on the theology of Bach and the theology of Bach's music. But he did a book called Death Set to Music, Masterworks by Bach, Brahms, Bernstein. And it, it, this is one of my favorite books because, and by the way, you can only get it now again on A books and secondhand places. But um, it used to be your forebears and mine in the ministry. If you had a study, you had a skull in your study. You very seldom would go into a, pe a preacher's study. We didn't have offices. You used to. We used to have studies. Then we went to offices. Now you're if you're going on the, the the front lines today, dispatches from the front, you have a studio. But he, it, back then, if you were preaching the gospel and you had people visiting you in your study, it was also for you and for them, you had a skull, some kind of a skull. And that was a memento mori ritual. Remember your your death. And um, some, I even have I, uh, this shirt, my Memento Mori shirt, my skull shirt, but I also have uh, some, some skulls, some unusual skulls in my studio. Here's a, uh, an old skull that um, somebody carved, a sailor supposedly, allegedly carved into a, into a pipe, and it was a skull pipe. Um, and this was for the people in, who came to see you, this was for you to remember daily your death. But Paul Minier's book on Death Set to Music was not just on the one big death that everybody thinks about. No, we all encounter daily deaths. In fact, the founder of my tribe had as a motto, we die daily, based on 1 Corinthians 3, uh, 1530. I die daily. I am daily in the jaws of death. And... Um, and what, is it, what does it mean to die daily? Well, it's a daily death to self. It's a daily death to your ego. It's a daily death to sin. It's a daily death to greed. It's a daily death to prejudice, a death to privilege, a, a death to death. So we need to die daily to live. You die to live, die to self to live in Christ. So memento mori rituals that our ancestors had around these, these artifacts, skulls, uh, some of them actually were human skulls in the, in the pastor study. We're really memento vivir, uh, remember to live rituals. Memento vivir. Um, as you saw that skull and remembered your death, but you remembered that each day could be the last day of your life. But it was also to be, that made it be, the memento vivir, the first day of the rest of your life. So we live in that jaw of paradox, the, the both and. And I, uh, I, I, I love the quote, and I'm gonna give you this quote from the last page, it's called the postlude of his book, Death Set to Music, where uh, he is making what he calls one final point. Uh, I, he probably should have said one final coda, but I'm quoting here. The more we restrict the term death to its lowest and most neutral common denominator, its meaning in medical terms, the less will we be moved to think or sing about it. Only when we begin to think with Shakespeare about the many deaths created by fear or with the Bible about the many kinds of dying or about our Daily little deaths, will we be inclined to turn passion into sound and sound into passion? Isn't that beautiful? Passion into sound and sound into passion. And that's why Wesley, he had these two sayings. 
He goes, you know, we die daily. If you're being Methodist, we're supposed to die daily, which meant those little deaths that we die to every day. But he also had, is most famous. He's not famous for that quote, which is basically a Pauline quote. But he's famous for this one. Our people die well. And it's because we memento mori or memento vivere, remember to live, that we can say one day, as Wesley, and someday I, I just want to talk to you about, I want to do a whole Lent talk just on, on Wesley's death. But we die well, as Wesley died well. By the way, singing two hymns, one written by his brother that nobody ever sings anymore, and another one by, by Isaac Watts. But let's get to our pa lectionary passages. And uh, this is going to be a, a little unusual um, uh, Lent talk. Because I want to I focus on the numbers passage, but I want to just briefly mention um, some of the other uh, passages that we have here. Um, just to just kind of stir things up a bit. Um, Psalm 19, 7 to 14 includes this very famous, let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Um, a, a, a little phrase that every preacher has learned, sometimes we use it, say it out loud, sometimes we say it silently. Um, but the, the, the James text, which I really was tempted to do because it portrays Sozo Jesus in such powerful ways that if there is a single bullet that can heal, it is Sozo Jesus that, that can that um, just deal with all of the brokenness and the batteredness and the beatenness and, of, of our world today. Um, it's the healing power of Jesus. Mark 9, sometime you're going to get a sermon on this with me, for me, but this is where Jesus talks, everyone will be salted with fire. And, and this whole metaphor uh, of a covenant of salt and and being salted with fire, um, we have not really understood. You know, the the other religions, they when they practiced uh, animal sacrifice on the altar, they seasoned the animal with all sorts of uh, sweet things like honey or savory things like herbs. The Jews just did salt. Even if you, your offering or sacrifice was a, a kind of a wheat and barley pancake, it was salted. And the salt on the fire had huge significance. And a covenant of salt uh, mentioned is not paid enough uh, attention to. But the, the numbers text is uh, what I want to um, address here very briefly. Um, and um, in, the, in the reading of this text, we have the story of the people of Israel. Uh, and you, you should read it right now. Uh, and maybe I'll just put this in the notes. Always where it says show more. Uh, you've got some notes there. Uh, that maybe I'll just put the whole thing to make it as easy as I can. But it's a fairly long passage reading. But the people of Israel are, are grumbling because they're tired of, of the manna. They're tired of just the, the one, a diet of one thing. And every day it's the same thing. Every day it's the same thing. And they are um, yearning, yearning for, for the food in Egypt. Now, Egypt was known for a couple things. It was known for its bread. I mean, they, Egypt pioneered every kind of bread imaginable. Bread from lentils, bread from, I mean, they did sourdough bread and, their, and a different kind of leavened bread. But Egypt was, so they were missing the food. And the food of Egypt was famous in the ancient world. But what the Hebrews missed most, you ready for this? The Hebrews were most complaining about what they miss most. And even to this day, um, the Hebrew people are known for this. Um, they were missing most the seasoning of onions and garlic. Uh, onions, now the, the onions in Egypt are, are very um, sweet and, and, and kind of tame as compared to, I've come from West Virginia, I mean, we know onions, they're called ramps. There are some counties that you can't have any presence in a public school system three days after having ramps. You gotta wait three days to go back to the public school. I mean, so that's, 
as serious. But garlic, the, the, the people of Israel loved the garlic. And for them, it was more than just a spice. It was, it was more than just a spice that brought flavor and, and, and passion, if you will, and intensity to the, to the worst food you could have, the slave food. But it was also a symbol. I, I'm surprised it, didn't, it wasn't the, the land of, of uh, milk, honey, and garlic. I mean, because it was a symbol of the good life. It was a symbol of the life that, that God could make for us, even in the midst of oppression and suffering. You could even have that, that promised land experience. And so give us that. We, we need that, that, that spice of life. We need that brightening up. Well, all we got is this bland uh, blend of who knows what mystery man a mystery um, and um, garlic became throughout history the, a clove that kind of was the essence of Hebrew identity that could do the best of things in the in the worst of times and even have the joy of life memento vivir in the midst of uh, oppression and injustice but here's, here's, so they're complaining. They're, they're not happy. They're, um, they're, you know, just why? And Moses can't take the grumbling anymore. And he, um, he just says, you know, God, I can't take it. Just kill me now. I mean, they're killing me one way. Just kill me. I can't take this, this grumbling, this complaining. I mean, they're always looking back, wanting, wanting more garlic. So God hauls them in to the tent of meeting. Now, we, last week we'd had a tent of meeting meeting um, when you had um, the, the whole, um, we, we had one tent of meeting meeting with, remember we had the dispute between Miriam and, and Aaron and why can't we be as good as Moses? So God, ha God hauls them into the tent of meeting. The tent of meeting, it's a little complex here because you had a tent of meeting before the tabernacle. But even after you had the tabernacle, sometimes it's called a tent of meeting. So you have this, this tent of meetings where, where God would be present, where people would worship and praise. But we also have a tent of meeting where something else happens. It's when God says, okay, I've had enough. Uh, I'm calling a tent of meeting. It, it happened with Aaron and the, Aaron's rod. That's where it came out of this tent of meeting meeting where God was tired of all the complaining of all the people. Um, and so he, God, um, says, okay, all the leaders of the 12 tribes, bring your staffs, put them in the tent of meeting, and we'll see what happens overnight, and we'll see who's, the, who's going to be uh, my, my spokesperson. And that's where you have Aaron's rod, the only, the only staff rod that blossomed. It budded, blossomed, and, and flowered. And so you had, the, you had also the, the, the formation of the 70 um, that were given some of Moses' power because... They were complaining. It happened in a tent of meeting. So the tent of meeting, whenever you read this, it's either something, one of two things is going to happen. Either God's going to appear in, in, in clouds and in glory, and there's going to be a great time of praise and worship, or you're getting taken to the woodshed, or you, 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 you're summoned to the principal's office, or it's a time of reckoning. I don't, I don't care how else you, uh, how else you put it. Um, the... The, the, the tent of meeting was where God said, okay, I'm going to bring you around and I want to make sure you understand some things. We would call the tent of meeting today, it's time for a come to Jesus meeting. It's time for a come to Jesus meeting. It's time to let's get real about what's going on here and let's deal with it now. It's time to talk turkey. Um, and I want to suggest that the biggest need of the church today is a come to Jesus meeting so it can come to Jesus. We desperately need a tent of meeting. And I believe God is calling the church to this tent of meeting for being taken to the woodshed, if you will. We're being called to the principal's office. We summoned upstairs. And it's time for a come to Jesus meeting 
because we've not, the church has failed to come to Jesus. We have so been about in this attractional model, you know, the great mission statement that Jesus gave us. See, we didn't like the one he gave us. We had to write our own. Go and know the world. So let's go. It's not come. We made it come. How do you get more people to come to church? And But we, it's come to church. Go into all the world. Make disciples of Jesus. Okay, Missional. Uh, make disciples of Jesus. Relational. Of all cultures. Incarnational. That's what I call it, MRI. The default posture of the church. The default operating system of the church. MRI. Missional. Relational. Incarnational. But we made it about come to Jesus. To hear these propositions. So it's attractional. Propositional. And then it's very colonial because we expect Jesus to work in your life as Jesus worked in our life and in your tribe as he worked in our tribe. And so we're in an APC default rather when we should be in an MRI default. And we need, this is the greatest need of the church today. We got all these things about we need all this stuff. No, we need a come to Jesus meeting where we are reminded that we are to call people, it's not come to church, it's come to Jesus. It's come to Christ. For God so loved the church, right? That's what it says. No, for God so loved the world. The, bi the biggest come to Jesus meeting is for the church today to remind Christ's church that it's not to come to church, but come to Christ. The church is not about the church. We've made the church about the church. And how you do church and how you be church and all that. No, the church is about Christ. We are the body of Christ. And we are calling people not to find salvation in the church, but to be find a living community, a saving community, a healing community that is focused on, on Christ. The church is more than a bridge between heaven and earth or a bridge over troubled waters. It's not just a bridge to those in need, which it should be. But the church is a bridge, more than a bridge. It's a bride. The bride of Christ, the very body of Christ. And it's all about Jesus. And maybe it's time for us to rethink this tent of meeting summons that God has periodically with the people and its leadership. And maybe it's time for a come to Jesus meeting for the church so that we can be reminded about our first love that we've lost. The passion that burst into sound and the sounds that come out of passion. Where is our passion? Where is our sounds? It's all about Jesus. It's all about Christ. I have a friend in England. His name is Phil Knox. And He's just written a wonderful article about a soccer player. Um, I've read the articles. I'm just reading the headline, but I'm, I'm about ready to, to read it. But um, an athlete that was paid hundreds of thousands of pounds a month not to talk about Jesus all the time. And he framed his essay, and I love the title, How Much Would It Cost You to Stop Talking About Jesus? Um, how much would it cost for you to stop talking about Jesus? How much would you need to be paid to stop talking about Jesus? I'm reading that and I'm going, um, you sure I read that right? How much, maybe I, I thought I was reading, isn't it really how much would it cost to pay you to talk about Jesus? No. <laughs> that, where's our passion? Our passion. For Christ, such that we can't stop talking about it. Um, a fanatic has been described as somebody who won't change his mind and won't change the subject. Maybe we need a little more what we used to call fanaticism. Maybe we need a little more passion. Maybe we need a come to Jesus meeting to remind the church to come to Christ.
Semiotics is the art of angling, of turning things askew, upside down, inside out, cattywampus, sunny side up, over easy, scrambled, hard boiled. We hope you enjoyed today's journey, but always remember, it's more important you prepare the preacher than you prepare the sermon. <laughs>